So when we have a set of messages and we have them all at one time, that's when we look at using accumulator. Um, but sometimes what happens is the messages are sort of released over time. Okay, so pretend that once again, it's the same setup. We have a set of messages, four messages. We want to commit to all four of them. But instead of having all four of them at once, let's say that you know M1 is released on one day and then the next day M2 comes along M3 comes along next and M4 comes along next. Okay, so we don't, we never have all four of them, uh, or at least they're not released all together in a, in a single batch. Okay, so what, what can we do in this case? Um, so just like with normal accumulators, uh, the first attempt uh, that we, we looked at uh, was that you just hash them individually, and so that works as well. Um, so the day that we get M1, we can produce uh, the hash of M1, we can call that C1. And then the day that we get M2, we can hash it and get C2, etc. All right, so let's say that uh, we're, you know, this is something that happened in the past, and we're really interested in M3. Uh, it becomes pertinent to. Uh, verify that M3 was committed to at some point in the past uh, and in particular it might be on a specific date okay and so if we happen to get C3 on the day that M3 was released then that's fine then we we know that that this was a commitment to C3 when we see M3 and it's revealed later but let's say for some reason we don't get C3 let's say we, maybe we get C1 we get C2 and then C3 I don't know, something happens that day, we don't get that commitment, and then we get C4 the day after, okay? Then if we don't have C3, it's useless, right? We, we can't verify anything about M3 at all. Uh, we either get it or we don't, okay? So uh, if we wanna verify all of these commitments, and maybe we don't know which commitment is interesting, um, what we have to do is make sure we get all the committed values as they're released. So. I'm talking sort of vaguely, so let me make this sort of concrete. Let's say that these are like, I don't know, maybe inventions or patents, like someone has an idea, and so when they have an idea, they, they sort of produce a commitment to that idea, and what that means is it kind of locks it in time. So if there's ever a dispute, let's say someone rediscovers the same idea later, they can say, hey, I had that idea before you um, because, look, I, I committed to it uh, previously, okay? Uh, I didn't tell you what the idea was because this is a hiding commitment. Um, but now that, that someone else has rediscovered it, I'm willing to show you what that idea is. And of course, if nobody rediscovers it, then that's fine. Then you can sort of keep it secret for a while. Maybe you start a business around your idea or something like that. Okay, um, So that's kind of the, the model we can think of. And that whole process works. So if you invent something, you publish a commitment uh, to that something. Uh, and if people observe the commitment and they know when they received the commitment, then they can figure out uh, when you invented it, okay? Um, and there, there's a few caveats that we'll get to, but um, there's a couple questions that we may have. Uh, the first one is, how do you ensure that the person who's going to become interested in this actually gets the copy of C1, right? So maybe, I don't know, you, you publish it in a newspaper or something like that. Um, so, so you can go back and get that copy of the newspaper. Um, and then the other question is, does it really prove if, if C1 um, is published in a newspaper dated January 1st, does that mean that M1 was discovered or created on January 1st? And the answer is no. Um, it could have been created a lot earlier, right? This could be an idea that was 20 years old and it was just published in a newspaper on January 1st. Um, but what it does guarantee is that the idea was no newer. It wasn't like someone on January 20th, they saw somebody else invent something and then they wrote up a description of, of what was invented. They called it M1. And then they tried to, um, tried to argue that, that it's uh, in the commitment from January 1st, okay? Why is that impossible? Well, this value is published on January 1st, right? And so there's no way to open this hash up, this value up to something other than the message that you knew. Uh, if you could open it up to a new message, um, then you would break the collision resistance of the hash function. 
Okay, so what this gives you, this, this whole sort of procedure gives you is, it gives you a, a timestamp in one direction. You know that something's um, at least as old as January 1st, might be older, but it's at least that old. Okay, so it gives you a time bound in that direction. Now, I mentioned a problem, which is that if you're interested in C1 and you don't happen to buy the newspaper that day, well, with newspapers, you can at least sort of get them retroactively. But um, anyways, you, you need to absolutely get a copy of that newspaper for that day if you're interested in M1. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to be able to verify it. Okay, so what we could do instead that's a little bit better is um, on the first day, uh, we hash M1 and we produce C1. And on the second day, we have M2, we're going to hash it. What we could do is we could actually hash in the value from the previous day along with our new message and call that C2. Okay? And then similarly, uh, to produce C3, we take M3, the message, we take the previous value, uh, which was the C2 value, and then we produce C3, and uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, okay, so why is this valuable? Well, let's say that we're interested in M1. So I want to know whether M1 is uh, committed. But for some reason, I don't get C1. Okay, so I don't, I don't have C1. I'm not sure what C1 is. I don't buy the newspaper that day. Okay. What can happen is, let's say, but then let's say that later I do buy the newspaper. So let's say I buy the newspaper on this day. Um, so I do get this C3 value. Okay, so this is a value that I do have. And um, C3 is only a, a commitment to M3, right? But it actually ends up being more because, because C3 is a, a commitment uh, to M3 and C2, C3 kind of locks in C2. Okay, so it's locking in the value M3, but it's also locking in this value C2. You can't change this value C2. So someone can just tell you, this is the C2 from yesterday's newspaper. You'll know it's C2 because it's locked in uh, based on C3, even though you've never seen C2. So you can actually validate uh, that this C2 must have been correct. And then you can say, well, this C2 came from this M2 and this C1 value. And I know you didn't see these two values, right? but it is locked in uh, as a result of that. Um, and the C1 value came from you know, the newspaper on this particular day, and uh, this is actually the hash of M1, okay? And so basically M1 ends up in the value of C1, and C1 ends up in the value of C2, and C2 ends up in the value C3. And so if you see C3, you don't just have a commitment to M3, you actually have a commitment to every previous value. So the newest value locks in all the previous values, the complete history of this. And this can go back an arbitrary uh, amount of time uh, and you'll still be able to validate it. So we call this a hash chain um, because you're sort of, you're hashing something and then you're linking in the previous value. Um, and so this is a much better data structure uh, than if you want to accumulate over time. Uh, it, it costs almost the same. All you're doing is you're just linking in the previous value. And then once you have this data structure, notice that you can't change anything about it. If you could change C1 or you could change C2, you're breaking collision resistance uh, to get it to come out to C2. And you also can't reorder things, okay? so this gives you an order where M1 had to have come before M2, had to have come before M3. And by have to come, what I, what I really mean is was committed to. Okay, so, so it's totally possible that, that someone invented M3 before they invented M1. But the order that they were committed to is this exact order, and you can't change it. And if you were able to change it, you would break the collision resistance of the hash function. Okay, so this, um, this is actually a very strong... Uh, kind of primitive uh, that that binds all of this stuff together. Um, so let's let's take a, a few notes and then um, I'll show you a kind of more sophisticated way of doing it. Um, so if you see C3, uh, then 
M3, M2, M1 are all locked in. Okay, and uh, so this is a binding commitment to all of the messages. And uh, M3, M2, M1 cannot be reordered. So you can't change them. Uh, we'll say cannot be changed or reordered. Okay, now there is one downside to this, which is uh, if I see you, if I show you C3, you know that there was this previous value C2, but I was suggesting that maybe you could use this as a kind of time stamping. But the truth is you don't know when C2 was created, right? Um, maybe by convention you produce these values once a day, but if someone wanted to pump out 10 values in one day or 100 values in one day, you would have no way of just by looking at the cryptographic data structure, you'd have no way of knowing that, okay? So you have no way of knowing how long did it take you to make this chain. You could make a chain of a thousand uh, items in like a second, okay? So even if the chain is super long, that doesn't mean it's super old, okay? Um, so there's no um, notion of time uh, that's associated with this, unless if you're seeing these values distributed across time. Okay, so there's no inherent notion of time. So the chain can grow almost instantly. So you do have to compute some hashes, but they're very, very fast. Okay, so one thing that we might do, uh, a use case for this, is uh, people are like, okay, this is, um, this is actually a kind of uh, nice data structure. And what we could do with it is we could publish it in a newspaper. So once a day, we could publish the C1, the C2 values, C3 day values, or, or maybe once a week, uh, we could publish them. And then if we publish them, um, then you can always go back and you can check the network or the newspaper. And if we do this hash chain approach in addition uh, to, to, to publishing it once a day, then even if you don't get the newspaper on the particular day that you're interested in, uh, let's say you get the newspaper here, you can see that this value was, uh, was is inside this, this value of C3. Now you're not sure that it was exactly, you know, let's say these are coming out once a week. Um, because you see C3 today, you don't know that this was C2 was published one week ago and C1 was published a week before that. You just know it was published sometime in the past, okay? These two values came before C3. Um, but maybe you're, you're trying to establish an invention was, was invented five years ago and you can't get the exact copy of the newspaper, but you get one like two or three weeks later. And it doesn't matter if it was invented that week or exactly three weeks before you're sort of fuzzy you just want to know it was invented sometime in that year well you just have to get a newspaper sometime in that year that was published after when this value was committed uh, and then you can see uh, that this value is at least as old as this particular value okay so uh, this is actually published in the newspaper now there's a little twist that i'll, I'll show you in a second so um, I'll, let me pencil it in. it's called link time stamping and it's exactly the same concept, but what we're going to do is we're actually going to compose. Uh, we're going to compose Merkle trees and hash chains. So hash chains are accumulating over time. Merkle trees are accumulating a bunch of messages when you have them at the same time. And what we can do is we can put them together. So if on one day you have a set of messages, the next day you have a set of messages, the next day you have a set of messages, what you can do is you can have a Merkle tree per day to take care of the set of messages, and then you can hash chain your Merkle trees together to take care of the accumulation over time. Okay, so that's something called link time stamping. 
uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in one second. Uh, the thing I'll show you uh, first is, is what this actually looks like in a newspaper. So um, there's two newspapers, uh, the Financial Times and the New York Times, uh, that publish these today, like to date. So you can go in and get a copy. And I think it's, it's once a week. So this you can see this one is uh, the Financial Times. And it came out on Friday. So if you get the Financial Times this Friday, the Friday of the week that you're watching this video, uh, and you look in the upper left corner of the markets section, you should see this this logo. Um, so this is Guard Time, their company, and these values are uh, essentially the hash output. So they're essentially C3. There's a little bit more information in there as well, but uh, you can think of this as C3. Um, and uh, the messages that are being committed to, uh, they're not included in the newspaper. So the idea is that what you'll do is you'll come along and say, hey, that's my message there. I'm going to tell you what it is and you're going to hash it and you'll see that it comes out to this exact value uh, that's in the newspaper on that day. And then uh, what you know, what you can infer from that is that um, you must have you know, produced that message uh, sometime before this newspaper was published. Okay, so this is like C3, and uh, you know that it's at least as old. As Friday, July 17th. Okay, um, so let's pause here and then we'll put Merkle trees and hash chains together. <laughs> 